On the 10th of June, a fatality incident occurred where a contract worker, John Blau, was overrun by fire. It's important to analyze this incident from a lessons learned perspective and try and understand the circumstances under which uh, this, this occurred. Um, any incident um, is important to unpack after the fact to try and see what you can take from it and how you can apply that knowledge moving forward in terms of whatever role you're playing on the fire line. So what we're going to be going through now is a sequence of events told by the supervisor who was here on the day and he's going to explain to us the different elements of what happened and we're going to try and um, unpack what's, what happened in terms of this incident. Okay, the previous day we had the fire quite a bit north of there, northwest of the specific area the incident happened. I tried to contain it, it was still not in the plantation, but with the strong um, easterly winds it pushed it down into the plantation. It crowned and it ran. Then at the stage we tried to hold it on the north side of the main Bokopi road. And um, we were quite successful, it didn't crown all the way, it, it dropped down on, underneath the canopy, we, it was manageable. And um, I were actually, we, we had about eight houses on the bottom that was in danger, so I pulled down there with my team and, and two fire tenders, and we secured the houses. And when the houses were safe, I went back up to see on the left flank, higher up on the line, what's happening there. And when I got there, the, um, the, the, the weather picked up, we got a bit of a wind gust. But the wind was still, the fire was underneath the trees in the pine brush and it, it, the, it was heading away from the people. So where this incident happened, it was a bit off a slope and then about 20 meters down the slope was a road on which they tried to tie the fire down. Then it, it went up, up in the brush onto a side road and that road went to the main Bokopi road where the, fire, where the truck was standing and the guy was the driver of this truck. When I got there, um, I stood on the top with Marshall and um, I contacted my guys and they said, no, they've, they're done, they're on about out. And out of nowhere, it was the, the, the fire just shot into the crown. Now, normally a fire don't shoot into the crown without a fuel ladder or extreme conditions, but this, the conditions were not that bad. And it just shot up, and the moment it shot up with the intensity, it pulled uphill. So the guys who were on, on the ground teams who were on the line immediately turned around and they ran for the top road. There was a bunch of guys from the fire brigade, quite a lot of people on the main road. And the moment it started crowning, everybody ran out got into their vehicles, um, I shot out to the top, and um, when it was safe, I came, you know, when it dropped down again, I came back. Everybody ran out. Uh, we found um, where everybody gathered, gathered where it was safe. And then I checked my guys who were with me at the bottom, and they said, no, all of them are there. And then um, some of the other, other teams came to me, it's also a contractor for, uh, a civic culture contractor for us at MTO, said, no, they're missing a guy. So um, one of the labor came to me, and he was a guy who saw him last. Can you take us back to the 10th of June 2017 and explain the series of events from when you arrived at this position, uh, you left your vehicle and you went down onto the fire line? When you are here, one of the leaders tell us to go to help there, down there, and to go down right to here, to, to read that second road down there, where we are standing there, to go in. I was just going in with my team, but I see that we can't do nothing here. Because trees are laying down, they've been cut. I said, no. One of us, the driver of, one of us, he comes there to me. I said, no. Just go back to the truck. Because we, got, we, do, we can't do nothing here. The driver was not coming back. He was just coming. I don't know what, who was turning around. He goes to the other supervisor was standing that side. Right, can you tell me a little bit about your assignment, uh, what the fire line looked like and uh, your experience of what happened in, in this area? When we were here, when the fire was coming here, we were trying to make a fire belt here, but these, these trees were laying here, this one, it was green. So we said, no, we can't do nothing here. I can't do a fire, a fire belt here because these trees are, are blocking me. No, the team will go, go out. From your perspective, wh where were you standing and what did you see? Uh, where was John standing? And from, from when the fire picked up, which was the path that he would have taken from there? When I was standing down there, I see the fire was coming to us, but you can't do nothing there. And then you, you take the guys and go out. When we were on the road, the fire was still coming. When John was standing here, some of the other guys here, 
when they come to the road, the fire was spotting right at my back on this side. When they go to, to distinguish that fire, when they come, they go back, when they turn back, they see the fire was reaching the, the road. They can't go forward. They tend to go up on this way. I don't know if they can go that way, they will not reach that. They will, they will be safe on that. But they take this road to go out. All right, so as it's been, the story's been told to us, John was uh, standing approximately on the corner of that road there when the, the wind came through and, and uh, stirred the fire up and the fire started running upslope and the crew had to flee for their lives. Um, the approximate path that John and the crew would have taken is from that corner, they would have followed that uh, steep ridge line up towards the second road. Um, the reason they wouldn't be able to come directly across this road is the fire was already running through here. So they would have had to run up the slope to that second road and then his final path was across towards the vehicle. The following footage you're about to see is a simulated run up the slope which John and his crew would have had to take to, to try and get to safety. Now also try and imagine um, what the vegetation and the footing would have been like. The fire hadn't moved to this area yet, so making it even more challenging would have been the pine needles and the slash that was on the ground. And also the perspective, the, the, the slope is quite a steep slope, um, so making the, um, the final trip quite a, quite a tough and harrowing one. And then you add in the, the, the conditions in terms of the smoke and the heat and just the intensity of the situation. So try and think about yourself in, in that position and uh, what it would be like. If you could just explain to me where John was before the blow up of the fire occurred and then uh, which path he would have taken to, to get away from the fire. And once he reached his position on the road, what were the fire conditions like? What was the fire doing um, at that time? From now to day, while I'm standing here, what I've heard from my foreman, uh, my supervisor, what he uh, told us is like, uh, what I saw when they ran away from the from the first road uh, uh, down there, as he said, when they reached the fire, uh, the, the that road here, the fire was close to them, and uh, when John and the other team was still in the middle to come up here, and uh, he was on the last uh, side of the uh, uh, running line. Because of you also like to destroy, he's not a person who can run for, for something, he want to make sure. But unfortunately, he ran that way, he could survive when he, if he could take that road uh, down there, he could survive. But what I think is like, he was knowing the truck standing in front of him and he have to save the truck. Even he didn't mind of his own life as a person, which I know like this, he will either try and save the truck and I think yeah he was forcing his way through the smoke up to the truck and the smoke was pulling him down here and that's where he was found uh, the, uh, uh, lying. Uh, the fire didn't burn here in the road it is just this fire on top of the tree it was like a tongue uh, which is uh, pulling 
and that tongue was burning this log and as you can see that log is burnt like all over and it is burnt onto the ground into the soil after this uh, incident i instruct my people to be aware on the fire and at work whatever they do uh, safety must be first and uh, what I've learned also from Labor Department that they told us that the, the tree can be re replanted. Anything can be uh, replaced, but a life you can't replace. We go through something so, 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 so bad. You know what? Even like today, it is a review and it is a replaying in my life and uh, I, I feel still in my spirit, uh, if I could do something better, I will do it. If I could bring him back, I will really bring him back because he was my number one worker. Even in the morning, if I'm sleeping, he was there to do my work for me. So yeah, we, we have to look after our workers. On the end of the day, they are human beings like us. Wildland firefighters have a safety code which helps to guide them during operations. This is made up of the 10 standard fire orders and the 18 watch out situations. And these along with other safety guidelines can be found in the Incident Response and Fireline Safety Pocket Guide. Let's go through the 10 standard orders seemingly not taken into account in this incident. Obtain the current information and regular updates on fire status. Initiate all actions based on current and predicted fire behavior. Determine escape routes and safety zones. Establish lookouts in potentially hazardous or dangerous situations. Remain in communication with your crew, your supervisor, and all adjoining resources at all times. And last of all, once you've made sure all the others are in place, fight fire aggressively, having provided for safety first. Of the 18 watch out situations, the following weren't identified or taken note of. Safety zones and escape routes not identified. Terrain and fuels make escape routes difficult. Unfamiliar with weather and local factors affecting fire behavior. Uninformed on strategy, tactics and hazards. Fire not scouted or sized up. Constructing or working on fire line without a safe anchor point. Working a fire line downhill with fire below. Unburned fuel between yourself and the fire line. Weather getting hotter and drier. Wind increases and or changes direction, also dust and or fire whirls occurring. No communication link with crew members, supervisors or other resources. The 10 standard orders and the 18 watch out situations can save your life, but only if you are aware of them and aware of how to apply them. Target fixation, tunnel vision and fatigue can lower your situational awareness and result in you overlooking your situation and tactics. Have a lookout and someone assessing this, the assignment and constantly ask, are tactics right for current and forecast conditions?